Left. Right. What is up, my friends? Welcome to Sip Talk. Tonight, we are talking about the future of flying cars. And is there a future of flying cars? That's really the question. I think at some point in our childhood or at some point in the past, all of us have envisioned a future full of flying cars. Well, well, that's what we dissect. <laughs> is the future going to have flying cars or not? Uh, it's a pretty interesting conversation. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it. So I'll let you get there. See you guys on the other end. And, uh, if you haven't already, now's a good time to click that subscribe button and, uh, like or comment, whatever platform you're on, any interaction helps us out. So thank you guys. and See you later. This is Sip Talk. Grab a drink and enjoy. <laughs> Cheers. 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 All right. We are live despite some technical issues this evening. This is Sip Talk. This is also episode 187. My name is Justin DiGiulio, your fearless host out of my basement in New Jersey. No, I'm not in hiding. It's just a good amount of space down here. Joined by James, the Bosnator Boswell out of Charleston, South Carolina. James is a philosopher, a professional referee, a bartender, and most exciting of all, an accountant. James, how's it hanging? Oh, you're, fear you're fearful co-host in South Carolina, as long as you include spiders in that definition. <laughs> Thankfully, um, yeah. they haven't started to really show up yet, but late summer and early fall... Last year, like maybe like two weeks into my new job where I'm working fully from home, I wake up one morning and I open up the blinds and there is a giant spider <laughs> right in my window. That, uh, and look, I was like, I can't work. Dude, the world, the world is out to kill us. The world is, uh, you know, we're, we're just humans in a big, big world. And Yo, I couldn't work. Are... I had to like, I had to have one of my roommates knock the spider down and kill it before I could get back to my computer to resume my day. And that's the reason why I will never go to Australia. <laughs> like, I would uh, love to go to Australia. It seems like a really cool country. And the people that I've met from Australia have all been great. I can't go there. I think they have nine-legged spiders over there. It's very strange. The animals evolve differently. They're, you know, totally different, isolated. Con uh, They've got spiders yeah. that are as big as your head. And if you ask Australians about it, they're like, oh, yeah, they're, they're no big deal. <laughs> they might as well be like rats. <laughs> that's wild. Yeah, they're, 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 they're big enough that they should be paying rent. I gotta, I gotta address our topic here today because <laughs> we gotta get this at some point. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> um, today we're talking about flying cars, and uh, this is a this is a cool episode because uh, we came about this topic because Rasht, our fearless co-host, uh, he couldn't make it tonight, but he sent us in a group message. He sent us an article about a flying motorcycle. And uh, I didn't get a chance to read the article for a, a long time after you and him went back and forth, just bashing each other on how likely you think well, it is. Well, no, how likely he thinks we are to have flying cars or some version of that. And you just shooting him down like you would a flying, flying car, car driving across your, your yard. But uh, it is a cool topic because flying cars are cool. And it's it's like Jetsons futuristic. So uh, so roughly, I don't expect an exact answer here because I don't have it. How long has the idea of a flying car been there? Well, we got to fifty gotta, years, sixty years, seventy well, years. Let's go by a metric of let's go by a metric of the automobile and the airplane, right? So there had to be some, they had to collide somewhere, right? So airplanes and automobiles started getting general use around the same time um no i would say a couple decades earlier on the cars in terms of kind of not really like mass use right that well i'm like but so the airplane was invented well like flight was first like achieved in 1903 cars weren't really invented much earlier than that and I think I think you're going to find that it lines up pretty close with 
when airplanes started being used and when cards started being used outside of like extremely niche applications, you're going to see that the trend is pretty similar. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go with maybe a decade or so before the Jetsons. You know, maybe a, a handful of people had conceptualized the, the the idea of flying cars, but really a lot of people weren't talking about it until you had the Jetsons cartoons with these so guys flying. So, was around. the Jetsons 70s, 60s? I think it was I think it was 60s. So, uh, we, the, so 70 years, let's say, people have been thinking about flying cars. And uh, we still don't have flying cars. Yeah. So, <laughs> Kenneth says you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. <laughs> um, well, uh, let me ask you, though. What, what are you drinking down there? Uh, Milwaukee's Best Ice. Oh, very nice. I switched very up nice. from Bush Ice because Milwaukee's Best Ice was the same price as Bush Ice, but it came in a 15-pack. <laughs> uh, that's uh, compared to what, the 12-pack? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, kind of like spider legs, odd numbers. Um, so I got a Glen Livet here, and then I got a new scotch, which once I finish this glass of Glen Livet, I'm going to hit the new scotch. But Glen Livet's open. the new scotch? So, uh, I'll share it with you once I, once I open it. Um, so look, um, we well, before we get into flying cars and whether they're viable. Just the Glenlivet twelve. If they make an eight, it's the eight. No, it's a, <laughs> it's a twelve. Um, the other one is an interesting scotch, but it was it was on a cheaper side. Uh, it's like a sixty dollar bottle of scotch. I mean, I drink a lot of Doers, so that's like a twenty dollar bottle of scotch. So right, but, yeah. but I mean, cheaper good stuff. But you know, I mean, like it's a good stuff, but it's not the, the good stuff. Um, so look, before we get into the flying cars, we do have to talk. Uh, we had to talk about what happened uh, hours ago, as of this recording, in Texas. Uh, there was a shooter that entered a an elementary school. Apparently, second he, through fourth grade. He went to that school. He was in the high school. Uh, he may have been a recent graduate. I don't know if I got that right, but he went to the high school, and uh, he gunned down fourteen people. Is that right? Eighteen now. Eight, oh, there's, there's a higher... Uh, now, I understand there was one adult and most were kids. 18 and 2. Um, damn. Yeah, so uh, I did I did watch... It was 14 earlier. Yeah, I watched the Texas governor give a, a press conference earlier. And one, if you look at my notes here, one, one of the things I, I noted was that he called the shooter the shooter rather than the suspect. And I noticed that, like, some guy I'll just you know, get like videotaped shooting a bunch of people and then they'll take them to custody and they still call him the suspect. But I'm always thinking like, well, you know, we, we just kind of watched him do it. Well, I think <laughs> that's just like They're giving him the legal, they have to yeah, call the legal him. benefit of the doubt. But I liked what a straight shooter the governor of Texas was. Oh, yeah. Like he's <laughs> done such a good job with, with the state. Well, and, you know, I think when Texas finally secedes, uh, the... <laughs> You see my notes here about uh, how lawless Texas is and, and, and being so close to Mexico. They may just be become part of Mexico. <laughs> just... Yeah, we might. If, if Texas secedes, like our border crisis is just going to get worse. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just going to expand the, the border because there's so much more. Uh, yeah, because then uh, we're going to have to deal with all Texas. the crazy Texans. I would take Mexicans over Texans if, if Texas secedes. <laughs> um I would say I, I say I think they're smaller Texas, the, the Mexicans. I think they're smaller. <laughs> Texas yeah. are, are pretty big people. Um, I if if Texas wants to secede, I think that's fine. Like zero bullets should be fired over Texas's secession. Let them go. They already have their own power grid, which sucks. <laughs> and like, the, I'm pretty sure that the state is a like net taker when it comes to federal aid versus federal taxes paid so like i'm not really sure what we're losing here hmm. well i i don't know but uh, uh, interesting on the net taker uh comment so so should we anything else you want because it's 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 fucking insane there was just a shooting where was the last shooting was that also Buffalo. in texas oh, oh yeah all if right well uh, I'm probably missing one. Who knows? Like, the fact that we don't know when wh what the last shooting was and it was a week ago well, shows how big of a problem this is. And to me, it, it's utterly absurd that uh, I, I was I was reading a, a quick update on this before we started the cast. And Republicans have already said that they are going to oppose any new gun control legislation at the federal level. Like, 
Why? But <sighs> this happened in Texas. I get yeah. I get that there weren't armed citizens standing around this Topps supermarket in Buffalo. But this is Texas, the the big gun state. So yeah, but so what happened to a school? Well, what 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 better place for guns, James? This um, is a school. It's a place of learning. We need to defend that. <laughs> or we could just make it so that's way harder for people to get guns. So that way we don't have to defend anything. Uh, how could we do that? Dude, the, the shooter's eighteen. How in the world? Like. I'm sure it'll come out in the next couple of days as people do their investigations and whatnot. But in what world should an 18 year old be able to have access to a weapon that can kill 20 people in a relatively short amount of time? Yeah. Cause he, the, the, the shooter was killed and I'm going to have to assume that was a police officer who did that. So I don't know exactly how long he had before he was shot by the police officer. But I remember, I mentioned this the last time we talked about this, there was a shooting in Cleveland um, like a year or two, like two years ago, where the shooter took an Uber to like this district that was all shut down for like kind of bars and restaurants to have open streets. And so there were a lot of people there. He took mm -hmm. an Uber there and opened fire and killed nine people. Do you know how long it took the police to respond to him? No idea. Like 37 seconds. Where was this? Cleveland? Cleveland. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So if you're telling me like it took the police less than a minute to find him and shoot him. So I don't think that you can criticize the police response here. Yeah, but, yeah, if it doesn't you have get, something that you can kill nine or ten people. In, thirty seconds is is yeah, that's the point. Is thirty seconds is about as fast a response time as ever. And even if you have somebody who is around the corner with a gun, they still need time to assess the situation, make sure they're... People don't just hear gunshots and just pull a gun out of their pocket and turn in the corner, guns blazing. 30 seconds is pretty fast, but the number of people that can be shot and killed in 30 seconds. The issue isn't... And I was joking, for those of you who are idiots, uh, I was joking when I said, where better a place for guns than a fucking elementary school? That was a joke, because that's the, that's the solution that, that the, the hard right... And uh, the the gun lobby are proposing. We just put yeah, more armed teachers. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a great it's, idea. Yeah, it's not because it just doesn't. You're not going to save that many lives. You're just you're going to have just as many issues. And these people go into this. It's not like they're afraid of being shot. They go into this with a death sentence. The guy shot his grandmother. This guy's the gun guy from today shot his grandmother before he went to the school. Maybe the, oh, so that's maybe one more that they added to the fourteen. No, I think uh, that was already counted. I don't know. Who, yeah. Doesn't, well, like, Doesn't matter. Does we, matter? Let's, let's let's talk about flying cars. Otherwise, we're gonna go on a fucking long ass railroad ride into fucking gunland, the wild west. And uh, what better place to get away from railroad rides, railroad rides, than talk about flying cars? Say that five times fast. <laughs> I'm not gonna give it a shot. So um, well, we'll wait till the end of the podcast once you've had that scotch, and we'll try it again. Uh, so we got a. Uh, Conversation about the flying motorcycle, which was actually uh, it was a drone like motorcycle. It had the four propellers and uh, yeah, but they're like little jet turbines. Oh, what, were they jet turbines? But there's four so. of them. So yeah, drone like style. But you had the turbines because because if you have any weight to something, which it's got to have. Well, we'll get there. It has to have power. Power means weight. Weight means more power. So on a motorcycle, at the very least, you have the weight of the. Of the driver, I'll share with you this this scotch. It's called a uh, Kaol Ila. Not a not a bad looking box and uh, a cool looking bottle here. What region? Uh, the uh, Islay region, I would imagine. Yeah, Islay. Islay. Excuse me. Um, well, it's spelled I L A here, and then Islay single malt. I, I I always call it Islay. You call it Islay? Yeah. It's even nice. with even with the S. It, that's how it's pronounced. Well, I know a lot of drunk Scottish people that call it Islay. Yeah, it, it, like, <laughs> <laughs> but that might. Uh, so we'll we'll see how this is. I'll open it up. So I it's uh, gonna be smoky. Um, you want to introduce where we got the majority of the content we're gonna talk about tonight? Um, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the points that we're gonna be discussing were were introduced by a YouTube channel that I've come to really like uh, the guy's name is adam something 
So shout Adam outs what? to Adam something. <laughs> what Adam what? <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> the YouTube channel is <laughs> for anybody not following Adam something in quotation. Yeah, he makes a whole bunch of good videos. For me, I just envy how much he hates Elon Musk. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it's a bit absurd, but uh, mm, yeah, but for me, I just like for someone yeah. to have this much dedication to disliking somebody. It, yeah, it's it's a pretty uh, it's a motif in most of his videos. Yeah. So uh, all right, so Adam something. I got. I, I don't even know where to put this bottle. The de- this desk has way too much stuff on it. Um, but let's uh, let's get into it. I see you've just entered the notes. On our shared Google Drive, um, and I, you know, I, I like his videos. I, I, I'll give you that. And this particular article, and we're going to share another one from Business Insider. We'll implant some of that information in here. But uh, Adam something seems to think that flying cars are never going to happen. They they are a completely impractical, b hazardous. So they pose a lot of dangers. Uh, and then C, ultimately, they would be too detrimental to mental health. So you want to talk about the distance impracticality? Um, yeah. Like, if you think about, like, there's kind of like three different ranges that he talks about. And I think that it's a pretty good division so like if you're looking to go like a short distance like zero to maybe 30 miles or so a flying car is not really going to save you that much time because if you're in a big city you've probably got public transportation like a metro system or you could you've got a car and like if you're out in the country like a 30 minute drive a 30 mile drive in a car is only going to take you maybe 30 minutes yeah, or less if, you, if you're yeah. hopping on a highway somewhere. And, and you're yeah, the highway. and so like a lot of people think flying cars are just going to get you there super fast, but you have to remember that like you need to have you need to have time to set it up and land and and plan your route and everything. And by the time all of that's done, the little advantages in speed that the car ha- that the flying car has are going to be kind of negated by those costs, those time costs. And yeah, it's yeah. not like flying cars go super fast. You well, might be going well, well, 125 to 150 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. So, so you got short distance, which, and that even you could walk in that distance as well, right? Well, yeah, but you're not. If it's short, there quickly. Well, no. I mean, short short range is zero to roughly. If we're going to segment, if we're going to segment up distance, short range is anywhere from. It could be two miles, right? Yeah. Or it could but, be. It could be. You know, down the block. You're not. You know, you, but I think for flying, like if you you need to think, you have to start at this is a trip that I would be making by car otherwise. Yeah, well, and, but my point is, yeah, you got people like in the city. I walk a mile to get from the train to my office, right? So we're, we walk a lot, but in the suburbs, people would drive around the corner to you know to go to the the corner store or you know the, what, whatever if you remember our store. apartment complex yeah you remember where the mail center was yeah we would you could walk there but it was a long walk so we most of the time drove to it no i never i never drove to it but i'd see some people <laughs> like it was about a 400 foot walk from our apartment and the farthest it would be for anybody in the apartment complex it might have been about a 2 minute walk and I would see people all the time get out of their apartment, drive to the mail center, unlock their mailbox, and then drive back. And it didn't even save them any time. No, it doesn't save you any time. And that's, and that's why the short distance sounds like it's not ever going to work for a flying plane. And that's up to roughly 30 miles or so in terms of distance. And then, so outside of 30 miles, I'll let you... Yeah, so then you get like your medium distance. And I, I think you can kind of look at this as what's... What's the distance that you would drive but not take a commercial airline for? And he sets it at about 300 miles, and I think that's about right. I did. I, I went up to the Albany area, actually like Saratoga area, from down here. That was probably, I feel like, 200 miles or so from the city. And it, and it would not have made, no, maybe a little less, maybe uh, like 180. City to so. Albany is 150 or so. Yeah, but this is going up to Saratoga area. So, so add another 20 miles. Yeah, but but it would not have been practical at all 
to take a plane and then taking a train means you'd have to drive to the train station, take the train, but then you would not have transportation when you got off the train. Yeah. So the only way that would that would make sense to me is kind of like by car. Right. And I think the, this medium distance where if you've got longer trips that are still more practical to drive, that's kind of the sweet spot for flying cars because – over 30 miles, the difference between being able to go 110 or 150 miles an hour versus 60 miles an hour isn't going to add up to a huge amount of time savings just because the distance is too short. But if you have to go 200 miles or something, you're looking at like an hour to an hour and a half versus three or four hours. Yeah, if I that trip could have been done in a flying car, actually. I envision it now, and uh, it would have been scary as fuck. But uh, sorry, get the next next distance here. Well, and then, so yeah, and then anything else longer than that, 300 miles plus, like flying cars are going to have limited range and they have limited speed. So a commercial airline is going to be going between five and 600 miles an hour. And your flying car is going to top out at maybe 150. And it's not going to have anywhere near the same range because... The no, fuel, it's got to hold the fuel on it's it. It's got to hold the fuel. And also, like, you think about your, if you've got a car traveling as a car, it's going to be relatively fuel efficient, like 30 miles to the gallon or so. But the same, that same car now having to fly is going to be burning a lot more fuel because you don't have to just overcome the rolling resistance and the wind resistance of being on the ground. You have to generate lift to keep a two or three thousand pound object from being in the air. Which, which, yeah, which it it takes a lot of fuel to lift off. But then also, like, you can't design the car only to fly, right? Mm-hmm. The car has to have some land application. And, and in theory, you could use the same engine to drive the wheels as it does yeah. drive the propeller. But. It takes a lot of power to get an airplane flying. Like you'd need a pretty high horsepower engine to generate enough propeller speed. It's like your average sedan that makes 150 to 200 horsepower. That's not enough to fly. Not to get off the ground in something that weighs as much as a sedan. <laughs> yeah, um, and you could kind of cheat a little bit in terms of getting off the ground because you could use the engine to power the wheels to get going up to takeoff speed, but it's then having enough power to drive the propeller to keep airspeed so that you don't stall out and, and crash into a hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't have that aerodynamic. You're not as it, but we'll get there well, uh, in but the air. Basically, at 300 miles plus or whatever, you're starting to consider a commercial airline flight. And those are way faster. Well, because 300 miles plus is also the uh, 18,000 mile. Like, or uh, how far away is Japan from, from New York? Uh, I think it's, Probably, it's more like, like nine or 10,000 miles. Yeah, I was going to say about that. Because you I'm can't thinking really ever California. get more than about 12,000 miles away because the Earth is like 24,000 miles around. So, like, you just draw a circle somewhere, you'll be able to get there in 12,000 miles. Yeah, and that would be as, as far as you would. You know, <laughs> it wouldn't make sense to go three quarters of the way around. You could just go the quarter way in the opposite direction. Yeah, the only, the only time that that, like, there's exceptions to that is if there's restricted airspace such as like all of Russia or Antarctica. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so flying cars aren't that fast. So at the long distance, it sounds like you just don't have the fuel capacity and you're not going fast enough. And, uh, and that's a lot of time to be in a very small aircraft in the, in the air. Um, plus planes are way faster and rail commuting by rail, especially if it's high speed rail, would probably get you there faster. But there are some, I, I recognize there are a lot of downsides with, with rail. Like, well, let's talk about like the limited upsides because I was thinking about this earlier and I, I made the connection that whenever someone talks about how they wish they had a flying car, what they're really saying is, I don't like traffic. Yeah, I would, I would think the idea would be to get out of congestion um, so there's there is a major upside with that. I'll, I'll give you well, that. You know what? We already have like for 
for people that have the money, like a helicopter is what you're looking for because they fly fast. They can land pretty much anywhere. And like, the, dude, I didn't even, the idea of helicopter never once entered my mind in all of the, in all the preparation we did for this, this episode. Like They're for example, like Kobe Bryant, <laughs> Who, who died in a helicopter crash. Like that's how he got around LA most of the time. It's cause he yeah. had the money to be able to afford yes. one. And that's, and that's tragic, but helicopters. Well, are he not wasn't the one dangerous. flying. He wasn't the one fault. flying. Yeah. But, uh, but they're, you know, just because it happened to a high profile celebrity, it's, it's not very common that there are helicopter accidents at all. No. It, I don't know what the rates are offhand, but you would hear a lot more about them. No, they're not very yeah. common, but like, for, for people that are super rich that live in an area that is congested and they care about getting around, a lot of them use a helicopter to get from one side of the city to the city, uh, one side of the city to the other faster than anybody else. Yep. It's just super expensive. So the nice thing about helicopters is that they can land and take off mostly vertically. Mm -hmm. The downside with a flying car is that these things are designed to have to be kind of taking off and landing on a landing strip and uh, because otherwise you, again you're just going to do the helicopter yeah uh, the, the, go the thing is a helicopter can't drive around the road so the whole idea no. of the flying car is, is for both um but if you if you're landing you need some type of landing strip the landing strip has to be illuminated well because think about your car headlights your car headlights even when you when you're driving you go around a turn like you have What's very the farthest limited, you can see, maybe three hundred feet. Yeah, tops and not and not well at the far end of that range. Mm -hmm. And also, you don't have much up and down range. So when oh, you come no. over a hill, you can't see shit. Um, and uh, so, so you're not going to have a giant spotlight that's going to shoot two miles in front of you. Like planes, right, and, planes don't get around look with a spotlight in front of them. Even well, a not, boat. And also, like, you need specialized landing strips because do we really want to have, like, highways where cars are just, like, taking off and landing in traffic? Merging, merging vertically as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, and, then, and then also uh, weather. You know, planes do a pretty good job landing in weather. Not extreme severe weather, but they, they, I'm always surprised. Like, there's storms going on. Flights are delayed, but they're still but yeah, kind of like Also, around. raise your hand if you've ever been on a, like on a flight that was delayed because of weather. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but snow and, and rain and just, and visibility is a big aspect of flying and airplanes, commercial planes don't worry about that as much for what, two Well, reasons. that's because the, the pilots are highly trained, but what well, they have a lot more technology. Um, but they they also fly above. They're able to fly above the storms. Yeah, but all commercial pilots are going to be trained on how to fly instrument only. Yeah, and and of course they land through that. They they spend time with zero visibility. So yeah, it's uh, it a flying car, which is not which is going to be flying at at the cloud level, if not lower, maybe maybe higher in in some instances. But um, yeah, but depending on where you are and what the terrain is, you might not have a choice but to have to fly at cloud level. In which case, you're going to need to have someone who's trained in being able to fly instrument only. Yeah, and so the amount of training is going to be that license. Because just getting required. your basic pilot's license is not IO training. Like, that's a that's a separate certification. Yeah. Um, so do we? Do, are we getting right. into the, the so, danger? Uh, no. I feel like we're, we... Well, we're still we're still talking about like how impractical they are. So like you talk about like weight with cars okay um so yeah you, you 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 point out they need to be lightweight because like ma like having a super heavy car that's just on the on the road for most people that's not going to affect the driving experience that much like unless you're racing but for example like the new hummer electronic the new Homer electric vehicle is like 8,000 pounds. Holy fuck. <laughs> because it's got a crap load of batteries in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like, because it has to, because it's a big vehicle and it has to go long distances. Yeah. So it has and to And for comparison, it. most sedans and like most regular cars are going to be between three and 4,000 pounds. 
most SUVs are probably going to be between 4,000 and 5,000 pounds. And then like your bigger trucks are going to probably top out around 5,500. So the Hummer is like way out there. It, um, yes, yes, it's four times that the way. I want to look it up, actually. I was I was helping my friend change a tire on his Chevy Aveo. You know what the Aveo is? Mm -hmm. 9,000 pounds. Yeah, that's insane. So his his Aveo, I was helping him change the tires. They Those lug nuts were on so fucking hard. I ended up having to get a breaker bar. But in trying to take the lug nuts off the car, I was spinning the wheels because I was lifting the car off the ground. <laughs> yeah, the so, Aveo is probably like 23, no, probably like 25 to 300, 3,000 yeah. pounds. Like it's, that's uh, a lighter car. But so the idea is like, you're going to need to build a flying car super light because mass doesn't really matter when you're on the ground, but it very much does when you're in the air. Yes. And um, so you're going to have to make all sorts of concessions in terms of structural integrity exactly. or price. And like, if you get it and you mentioned because, like, because ultra because ultra light material is extremely at this point in time extremely expensive. Yeah, because um, you make the point of if you're in traffic and you get like a bumper tap or something, or you get a scratch on the car you're or like a chip or, or yeah or like a crack somewhere, that's not going to affect your ability <laughs> a crack in the bodywork. That's not going to affect your ability to get from point A to point B safely. It's going to be the exact same. You're fine. Well, but 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 even a crack in the windshield that doesn't matter so much because the pressure inside and outside of the, of the vehicle doesn't change that much, right? And the yeah. temperature inside and outside the vehicle doesn't change that much. But as pressure and as temperature change, that crack will spread. Well, if you're flying, if you don't have a pressurized cap and you're good to about ten thousand feet. Okay, so that that would be within the range of where you're flying cars. Yeah, uh, but still, like, who would want who would want to crack on their windshield at a high speed? And then, yeah. God forbid, you hit a bird or something. Well, and oh. also you've got a major temperature change because, like, at ten thousand feet, it's probably twenty to thirty degrees cooler than on the ground, if not more. Well, that's that's the same pressure and temperature. I got a, a chip in the windshield uh, a month or so ago when it was still pretty cold here, and uh, the next morning that chip had spread to a crack that went three feet across the windshield. Just, just because the expansion, just because the temperature change exactly. Uh, all right, I'll let you hit the next but, line. Yeah, so like, if you've got all these things that aren't going to affect the safety of a car, but they would definitely affect the the safety of a plane, because if a plane has a crack in like a structural element or something, like that structural element, uh, like the wing, that's not going to affect how a car rides. But like, if you've got a crack in the wing, like you might be flying a one wing a one winged <laughs> plane soon. So and uh, yeah, that's it's, basically it's, just a missile that's going to target the ground some fu some distance in the future. <laughs> um, so let's just talk about design a little bit, though. And this is from Business Insider: uh, is that cars need to be low, and they need to be wide so they don't flip. If you're going around a turn in a car, like a Jeep, the old Jeep Wranglers used to tip over all the time. Yep. Um, so you know you want to have that low, you know, low uh, design center of gravity at the bottom, um, and then cars also need to generate downforce. So if you look at, uh, you'll like this comment here. If you look at any like supercars because they go really fast, they have spoilers in the back. But also cars are designed aerodynamically to create this downforce. And then, funnily enough, the only other type of cars you see, uh, spo you know, spoilers, the wing that you see <laughs> in the back of cars is like the is like the the. 14 year old like uh yeah know, honda civic or or you know there was a really good picture i saw <laughs> of someone that had like screwed in like the bolt plywood and, yeah like it, it was like two <laughs> like two by fours and then like a piece of plywood and the caption was in spanish and it said eso si es tuning <laughs> <laughs> yep but like uh, yes this is tuning yep <laughs> um, fine tune yeah, but yeah, like cars, if they aren't designed for, like, un unless they're designed for it, cars naturally generate a little bit of lift. So yeah, they design e e in either the underbody of the car or some of the elements of the bodywork itself, elements that are going to generate downforce. Now, most regular cars aren't going to generate much downforce, but you want a little bit. Because if you're going at high speeds and you're generating lift 
and you go to take a turn or something, now you're not going to have any grip. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the Alfa Romeo, the old spiders, not the new Alfa Romeos, the old ones. Uh, when you get to like 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, you could feel the uh, the front of the car. Like you could you could watch like it would raise. It would still be on the ground, but it would be it would be higher kind of in your line of sight because it wasn't that aerodynamic. Um, and then you just the handling was terrible. Um, same thing on the 911, which has a lot of downforce, very very aerodynamic, but the weight of the engine is in the back of the car. Um, so you, you know, you want as much downforce in the front of the car as, as possible, uh, for when you're turning, but planes, on the other hand, they don't need downforce. Gra- gravity is pulling them down as, as more than they need. Planes need up force and they need constant up force because they have to fight this thing called gravity. Um, and then oh, planes, oh, you know, what, what you do is you take a car that has a lot of downforce and then you fly it upside down. I never thought about that. Yeah, we could just flip them over like uh, <laughs> one of those remote control cars that that goes both ways. That would be that would work. You're right. You're uh, you know we're disproving ourselves. Um, and then also planes. There's all sorts be, of reasons why that's a bad idea, though. Planes also need to be narrow. Well, yeah, because you're the occupant. Um, but planes need to be narrow, whereas cars need to be wide. Um, and and this just creates an issue because you need you have. You have parts and you have design of one vehicle, the car or the plane, that are counterproductive to the other part. Like wings and, and blades or propellers, uh, they add a lot of weight to the car and they actually they take up a lot of space. Like any, any of those convertibles where the convertible top goes into the trunk, you have like no trunk. We're not talking about a foldable convertible top. We, we might be talking about foldable wings, but, but these things have to be big. And they, they... Yeah, think about how much more area a wing takes up than a rag top <laughs> exactly it, and it has to be structured there has to be some real integrity behind the structure which usually means it needs because well, be... what's holding up all three thousand pounds of your car dude it's scary to think about this stuff like but you the bigger wings the more weight on the on the car that's the right. problem and then the, the smaller the wings the shittier your plane you're gonna have so yeah where are these wings going well it, it Like you kind of raised a good point is like, you're going to probably need to have them stored at home and you're going to need to have like, like your own direct, like landing strip in your backyard that (laughs) is safe to like take off and land in. And then you're going to need to have somewhere else that also has a landing strip in a place that you can store the wings when you land there. And now you just have an airplane. Like you might as well just have like an airplane and then like a car at your house and a car at the other airport. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. This is, again, this is impracticability. So let's get on to, because uh, we were talking about like having some, some fender benders. Um, let's get on to the hazard section. Well, I'll, let you, I'll let you lead here. I'll start you wanna... with the, the, the thought that I had, which is think about how poorly many people maintain their cars. Yeah, yeah, not ever, about you, you, not like about tires that are completely bald or like tires that have like a bulge out of it this big or not changing the oil for 20, 30, 20, 30 <laughs> 40, 80,000 miles. Some people have no idea to change the oil. Yeah, yeah, and any or like the check engine lights on. <laughs> nope, all right, it went off. We're good. <laughs> um, like, th- now that's a problem in and of itself with cars, but. Most of the time, they're only going like if you're if you're driving along, and your car's engine blows, and you no longer have power coming from the engine. What do you do? You you, you parachute out if you're if no you're, no if, you, if you're on the road, <laughs> you, you just throw you just into sputter neutral. To the side, you yeah. like sputter to the side of the road, and you call a tow truck. If you're in a flying car, and the same thing happens. Um, <laughs> your parachute is your option. Yeah, that's there, there's no there's no sputter into the side of the road. It's crash landing and die, or maybe parachute out if you are a lucky motherfucker. Yeah, because you're gonna need to hope that you have enough power to the systems to be able to glide your way to a cla- crash landing. Yeah, which I mean is very uh, improbable. It's it's not. Uh, it's very unlikely. So, so for that reason, uh, flying cars would need to be banned above any populated areas or any important infrastructure. Well, think uh, of like so in the video that Adam something makes, he he takes um, 
a map of I think it was somewhere in Hungary, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's if you look at like areas that are no fly for commercial airlines or or even just like private flights, there are tons of areas that you have to be aware of that you're not allowed to fly over. Uh, he yeah he talked about uh, migratory bird routes, wildlife reserves, uh, power infrastructure, you got power, power lines, plants, military power... airports. You can't fly over an airport. Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't. You're not supposed to be able to fly over New York City. I thought after nine eleven. No, that makes they sense. They may have changed that, but but yeah, there's there's lots of places you have to be knowledgeable. You can't drive over. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, if you were to look at a map of like any populated area. It's going to be this checkerboard of places that you're not allowed to fly over. Which, which means where are you flying? If you can't fly to a destination that's populated, where are you, you flying from a, a cornfield to a, uh, a dairy farm? Yeah. In which case, just get yourself a plane. <laughs> or a helicopter. Yeah, or a helicopter. Um, yeah. not uh, the, the no-fly zones create a, a, lot, of, a lot of issues. Um, and, and so we, it, like we talked about, I already mentioned traffic, but now if you've got no fly zones, you've got all these corridors, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to be in traffic just a thousand feet up. Well, you know, if there's, uh, if it's, if it's mass adopted, um, then you need to build corridors, right? Because then it becomes much more dangerous. It can't just be a fly for all, a free for all. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, um, but you're right. Then you get some congestion, which is kind of the main reason why you would want some type of flying vehicle from the beginning. Yeah. So I, with commercial airline, air, um, yeah, commercial airlines, do you know what distance planes have to keep from each other? No, but I know that they have a lot of anti-collision systems or, or that, you know. So like that's air big, traffic big control problem. monitors this. Like yeah. The planes have systems, in, but like it's mostly air traffic control that's aware of this. So any commercial flight must be either 1000 feet vertically separated from any from any nearby flight or 5 nautical miles so if they're at the same height they need to be 5 nautical miles away from each other what's the difference between a nautical mile and a regular mile i don't know but <laughs> let's just call it um, fine 5 miles it's probably it's close enough in terms of their distances but like think about how big of a separation that is I'm, I, can someone tell us the difference? Uh, uh, clearly, you're not American. Oh, I just got. <laughs> I didn't see all these comments from uh, from Kenny Cushman here. He's ripping me apart. Uh, Nautical mile is 1.15 land miles. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. So you have to be about five and a half miles apart. If you're at the same height, you need to be five and a half miles away from any other airplane. So that rule is going to probably apply to low level flights too and how are you going to be monitoring where all these other flying cars are and keeping your separation by either height or distance it uh yeah you need it's got to be software right like it's got to be all software which we have a difficult time right now developing self-driving cars and that's on a that's on a a plane, right? That's not a yeah. two dimension. So the, uh, the which kind of gets me to before we get to the mental health aspect, like it makes me think that if you were to do flying cars, they would have to be one hundred percent autonomous. And yeah, but th just think about this: we're we're de trying to develop aut autonomous cars on a two D X Y like the roads, right? Yeah, and that's not going great. And then and then and we're having difficulty doing that. Now you have to invent. Now you have to introduce an entire another dimension a third dimension and the infrastructure to support all of that we, well we don't have the we don't we don't even have the infrastructure to support the 2d because it's it's so challenging there's so many variables and and you're not in control of a bird flying out or there's so many more factors in instead of just other cars right like you also have to deal with wind way more than you do when you're on land like there's a lot there's a lot going on there um so, but the thing is, yeah, if if this if flying cars become mass adopted, then you really need to narrow it down to kind of these busy, focused 
uh, transit corridor. So only pathway right. for, for, but you know, and, it, so, and, then, and then if you're going to do that, why not just take like the existing mass transit that's already there? Because if it's a big <laughs> corridor and it's a big area, they're trying to get to another big area. There's probably already like a high speed rail system. Uh, you, that's you, existing you, beat for me, you beat me to the punch. Cause I was going to say, you're going to need these, you're going to need the corridors and you're going to need places where people can get, get on and off. And then you're going to need the ma major transit hubs. So something exactly like a, train station or a plane station uh, or a plane station uh an airport <laughs> plane <laughs> or, station four plane station five a plane station atlanta plane station. <laughs> uh, so um or highways or actual highways like yeah. the cars that we have already <laughs> we've already built up infrastructure to accommodate for this need flying cars aren't solving any of the problems that we haven't already solved the, th the thing is that with flying cars, they just they could never have the same application that regular cars do. That's kind of the yeah. I'm not ruling out flying cars entirely, but you just you couldn't. Everybody who drives a, a car couldn't fly a car, right? It's just it doesn't work. Um, no, as of right now, if you even wanted to entertain the concept of it, you need to get your pilot's license. Well, we're, we we will get there uh, with this Business Insider article about the actual production, the current production of flying cars. But let's hit mental health. You go ahead with it. Oh, here here I go. Um, James, let me ask you: When you want uh, to relax, uh, what do you do? You turn up the music really loud and go hang out by the highway. Um. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> either that or um, like construction sites. Construction, especially if they're doing things. demolition work. Yeah. So the thing is, I mean, go some people like to like, go to the gun range. Some people like not shoot anything. Just listen. <laughs> just listen. What are you? What are you here to? Do? What, what gun would you like today? Oh, I'm just here to listen. <laughs> um, so no, the thing about the thing about uh, flying cars is cars alone are noisy. Think about you know if you ever been close to a major highway or even a major road, like a new living in a building in New York City that faces an avenue or a street. You have lots of noise from the roads. But if you're by a highway, those noises are actually way louder. You have you have cars with exhaust leaks. You have cars with stupid, whiny, obnoxious exhaust kits on them. Uh, you have trucks, which make a shit ton of noise. Um, but those highways, most highways where there's residential areas, have barricades. They have the sound walls up alongside of them. Yeah. Um, and also, like, if it's something that you care about noise, like, when you buy a place, you know how much noise there's going to be because you got to see the location. So, like, probably properties that are very close to a highway probably have lower values than than quieter areas. Yeah, I, I, I think that would make sense. Um, so, uh, it's uh, like, if you don't like the noise, well, you chose to live there. But if you've got these flying cars that are all, like, flying at relatively low altitudes and kind of wherever they want like well think about the noise a flying car would make mm -hmm. and and what plane does that exist on it's a it's a sound bubble around a flying car at least with a regular car the sound kind of radiates forward and sideways maybe a little bit up but mostly forward and and and, and laterally um with with a flying car just think you can hear planes go by right and they're not that numerous if you live by an airport, your quality of life may may not be that great. Then it, it will it yeah. can affect your mental health. But in the same way that like buying near a highway, if you buy near an airport, you know what you're getting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sorry, I, I interrupted you there. No, it, it's yeah, it, it's like these flying cars are going to be just as loud as like a single engine Cessna or something, but they're going to be, on average, much lower than like single engine planes they're going to be just as loud and if they're mass adopted they're going to be everywhere so you're just going to have this constant buzzing or ed, like <laughs> yeah all the time <laughs> i was watching a, a youtube video some talk somebody was giving and they were at an outdoor uh platform there's outdoor stage and uh planes were going by and the guy the guy was like this is driving me nuts i know you guys have you, like speakers facing you, so it's a lot louder for you. But I can't think straight when I'm trying to speak, and these planes are buzzing by. So, so there, you know, that there is a solid mental health 
negative mental health a- aspect of flying. I think but it's the weakest of the three points, but it's I still agree. valid. I agree. And and on that, our Adam something YouTube video uh, information ends. But I do want to share a little bit on uh, the Slovakian company Aeromobile and what they're doing with flying cars because they actually have flying cars in production. The, and, you know, the issue, the last 50 years or probably even longer, 70 years of automobiles, road running automobiles, uh, they've had a basic blueprint that they improve on year after year. Right now, there's no blueprint for flying cars, not not one that is practical. Again, you're saying maybe you store the wings in your garage. You know, maybe they retract somewhere in the car. Maybe they fold up. But then again, if somebody bumps into you and bumps into the wings, it's... It, yeah, if they it, put a crack in your wing, you can't fly home. Well, but... And that's the thing. Like, if you get bumped, are you going to just go get on the road? I mean, in the sky and give it a shot? Or are you going to say, fuck, I'm going to bring this to a repair shop, have them check it out before I go get on the road? No, what you're probably going to do is looks like I'm driving home. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So, uh, but the point is, we, if this is even going to be something feasible, we, we need to have a, an actual production flying car. Like it has to be some type of feasible production that we can make. So the Slovakian company, Aeromobile, they've worked for 30 years to, to develop a flying car, and it took four iterations. Uh, so the, their co-founder, Stefan Klein, in the 90s, had this theory that you could fly and drive. And I think that's like, you know, back in the maybe 70s or so with James Bond, where they had that boat car. It was a, a what kind of car? Is it a Lotus? Do you remember that it was a white Lotus? The Esprit? Yeah, I think that's what it was, and they go underwater with this with this car. Oh, and James oh. Bond. James Bond, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, this guy designed the first concept car. Apparently, it was bizarre looking, and it was too big to actually work on the roads. So, uh, and that was thirty years ago, the nineties. Version two, they built in two thousand ten. It had collapsible wings. Uh, it could f- actually fit into a regular parking lot spot, um, and it had a range of. 545 miles on the road, which meant it had a gas tank big enough to get it that far, and 435 miles in the air, which actually doesn't doesn't sound bad. Um, and uh, it first flew in 2013, which is relatively recently. But it sounds like that test flight went all right. Um, but uh, they started building version 3 uh, at the same time, roughly the same time they were testing out version 2. Um, so they were developing this prototype for the Aeromobile 3.0 and that needed some upgrades. So it featured, uh, I'm looking at pictures of the Aeromobile (laughs) and like one of them looks like if you were to go to Disney, Disney world and get on the monorail, it looks kind of like that, but with like a wing. Well, yeah. And that's, (laughs) it's like a flying bus. Which one are you looking at? The V2 or the the next I don't know what the next is. I have V1, V2, V3. Oh, uh, I'm looking at the 4.0, and I'm looking at the AM Next. And the AM Next looks like if you took the Disney's monorail and said, put a little wing on it. <laughs> put a little wing on it. Uh, get some buffalo sauce. Yeah. Put some wings on it. Uh, so, look, so the V3 uh, had a reinforced body made of carbon fiber. It had advanced avionics, so it had some actual, like, piloting gear in it, like a plane might. It had new, completely... Uh, from the ground up uh, steering controls um, and it could be transformed from a car into flight mode in three minutes, which, you know, we were talking about like making this transition. It's not just going to, you know, it's just going to open the garage door, drive out three minutes is pretty quick. Three minutes is pretty quick. Um, But despite these advancements, the uh, Aeromobile 3.0 crash landed during its test flight in 2015, which was piloted by, uh, Stefan Klein, the co-founder, he went into a, a crazy tailspin, and via, uh, photos show the vehicle's framework just completely destroyed. I guess the thing was r- r- totally fucked. But somehow, I think they, I think uh, Stefan Klein parachuted out of the vehicle while it was falling, and he survived. How about that? Uh, and V four, which uh, 
it looks like uh, after three decades, they're, they've built this version four, and they're just awaiting certification from the government. Um, it's going to cost uh, $1.3 million to buy it, and it will require a pilot's license, and it is in no way ready for mass production. But maybe they no. make a dozen of them. So like, just none of this makes sense because – if you already have a pilot's license, so this thing costs 1.4 million, and for that 1.4 million, you're getting about you're getting a 300 horsepower car, and a, an airplane that can go about 160 miles an hour. Um, I'm looking at their website right now; these are their numbers. Um, so for 1.4 million, so you know how much like a single engine Cessna would cost you? Maybe a hundred grand. I, I'm just a guess. Probably somewhere between a hundred and two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand at the absolute tops. I imagine there's probably a decent number of them on the used market as well. Super available, and they're going to be able to fly at about the same speed as this car. And you could buy one of those planes, and then have another million dollars left over. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so this the version four was eight hundred pounds heavier than the the previous version. Uh, has built-in parachutes, built-in airbags, uh, and it took them more than 20 million bucks and 10,000 hours of test flights uh, before they felt that it was it was ready to like submit to the to the government for uh, certification. So, uh, you know, I read about this town somewhere. I think it's in Alaska, maybe, or way, way, way north. It could be in Canada. It maybe. I, I, I actually I saw a TikTok video of this girl that lived in this town. And everybody in the town has planes. So the, the streets in the town are super wide. Everybody's got a huge, almost hangar-like garage. Not huge, but they're, they're small planes. Um, yeah, they're all, like, so in Alaska, there's tons of towns in Alaska that might have roads within the town. And those roads aren't connected to any other roads. So the way that people get around in, like, the out, in, yeah, all the wilds of Alaska is these small bush planes that I, they're, they're like a single engine Cessna, but smaller and lighter weight. And like, there's some crazy videos of like these pilots practicing like low speed or low distance takeoff and landings where like they can take off and land in like a hundred feet. Uh, that's, that's interesting. But the thing is, Alaska is fucking huge. Alaska is a really, really, really big place. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you need that, you need that distance, but, Again, they don't have that, you know, they have the infrastructure effectively to have a car, a flying car. But yeah, like in Alaska, they just use their plane and they've got like every small town is going to have some small dirt landing strip that is built for the types of planes that go go there. And then once you get to town, like you can borrow somebody's car to get from like one side of the town to the other, which is probably a quarter mile. Like you don't even need a car. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds. It's, it's it's a solution in search of a problem. <laughs> uh, well said, well said, and that's you know the there is a very marginal demand for for a flying car right now, and the people that would want it would not be able to use it. Yeah, and like if you want to, the only people that are going to be spending one point four million on a flying car. They're, they're going to be doing it to, like, add some ticks to, like, whatever rich people use to determine their dick measuring contest. Uh, but, again, people bought computers when they were fucking enormous, right? Like, just people, people, will, rich people will spend money on something just to be the first one to do it or to have it. Right. Well, that's a so, dick measuring contest. It's, it's ah, what a weird topic, because I went into this wanting to be like, no, no, you know, you know Jane, Rosh is on to something, and, and I don't, honestly, I felt like we're, you and I are kind of taking the piss here and taking the opportunity to bash Rosh's idea just in long form, but we're not. It was, the, uh, the motorcycle that he showed, I felt like it was on to something. He he sent this video of the motorcycle, and it, it did have those kind of four turbines, and then you see the new Rocket Man like suits. Yeah, that but that's not wearing. a flying car. That's just a like a four turbine jet pack that you sit on. You're yeah. not taking that yeah. on the streets. You're not going to be like riding the motorcycle and be like, oh, let me flip the switch and I'll take off now. It's uh, I'm going to take off and I'm going to do my thing. Well, that's it, that's your your 
you're on an advanced drone, right? You know, with with the the jets on it or whatever. Yeah. It, you're you're not. It's a quadrocopter that you can sit on. But that's the issue: is the flying car issue. You already have helicopters. You already have cars. You already have a, a, a commercial airlines, and then you have the small small private planes and Cessnas. Um, I don't I don't necessarily and I'm not discounting anything like it surprised me. Somebody can make a comment and share with me what I'm missing on this. Well, here, uh, you, but there's I, just not space in the we just don't have there's no need for it. So I look at this in, in a way that so you go to a fine dining restaurant and for your main course. You have steak and then for dessert, you're going to have a really fancy like ice cream, right? And you say, man, that steak was really good. Oh, hold and on. Ice cream. We gotta, hold on. Stay, stay right there. Stay right there, James. Sorry to cut you off talking about steakhouse. We got to cut out of our live time here. So if you're watching on Instagram, uh, you're SOL. Sorry about that. But make sure. Let me pause this. All right. We are, we are off the live here. Make sure you guys subscribe on YouTube and all audio podcast platforms. Adios. Instagram. All right, sorry. So you had so, the steakhouse. Yeah, you're out at dinner, and for your main course, you have this really good steak. And then for dessert, they bring out this crazy, like, cake and ice cream concoction that tastes really good. And say, man, both dinner and dessert were just spectacular. And then someone says, well, I've got an idea. You could have. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where is this going? Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. You got a, you got a great steak as, as an entree. You got a great, great dessert as a, as a, as a dessert. And so then somebody says, why don't you have those two together? <laughs> <laughs> I only know one mutual friend we have that would say that's a really good idea. This person also wraps, uh, wraps chocolate chip cookies in cheese <laughs> and and has brownie mixed for breakfast not brownies <laughs> not the cooked brownies that come out of the pan just the the the, the mix before you pour it in what, what do you mean you're telling me james you're telling me you've never had brownie mixed for breakfast for real the the, the indignancy <laughs> with which he said that was what sold it for me <laughs> I got a great idea for a drink, by the way. It's uh, it's my two favorite drinks. Actually, we're on a roll here. Yeah, vodka favorite, and milk? Vodka and milk. I don't have a name for it yet, but I'm going I'm to name this drink. Oh, man. But, yeah, that's that's the way. Like, I look at flying cars as, like, steak is cars. Yeah, it's great. Love it. And ice cream is flying. Pretty good system. Like it. It works. Let, 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 like, let's not have the cake and the ice cream on top of the steak. <laughs> the, you, you've, you've managed to ruin both. The, the, here's where the issue. Here's where the issue lies. Is that it would, it would be cool. It would be bad. Everybody, everybody would have one. But if they would be so restriction ridden that you could maybe fly it around your own backyard, but you couldn't fly it into your neighbor's yard. You couldn't fly it over the streets. You couldn't fly it over your neighborhood. You couldn't fly it into the city. You couldn't fly it over the shopping mall. You couldn't fly it into the shopping mall parking lot. What? Where are you going with this car that is is regulated out of existence? It, and this is not like meaningless regulation either. This is like all of these rules would have a very good reason. Dude, I see so many people broken down on the roads. I, I had this this truck yesterday, uh, and the. The tire, the 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 tire tread was falling off, and there was just all this fucking crazy smoke, fucking giant pieces of rubber because they're big truck tires. So giant pieces of rubber that probably weighed twenty something, thirty pounds each. That you know were three feet long, almost a foot across. It was a, like a retread that was failing. Yeah, yeah, and just smoke and rubber shrapnel everywhere. And I almost, and then there was some in the road ahead of me because I was behind him. I, I was watching this happen. And I was like, fuck, should I just try to run over this? Like, and let it, like, go under the car? And I'm like, fuck no. And I had to veer, like, off into the shoulder. 
and around yeah, a big because that might look soft and flexible, but it's going to be rock hard. That's that's what I was thinking. I was like, it, it looks like maybe it's low enough, but then I remembered like in a split second, it popped in my head. Like I bought a, a floor jack, a hydraulic jack for the garage, and it didn't fit under the car, and it was like only that yeah. that high. So, um, I, you talking about like how poorly American cars are maintained? I remember reading a, a German was talking about like the differences between German and American cars. And they were talking about how in Germany car inspections are super rigorous where it's very easy to fail an inspection. And like people keep their cars in very good shape in Germany because they're not allowed to otherwise. Yeah. And they, and they said like, if you drive down a German highway and you look at like the shoulders, there, there's nothing there. There's going to be some dust and there's going to be some grass, and that's about it. Like, drive down an American highway, go for 10 miles, count how many car parts. Car, you see. Yeah, car parts or just fucking entire cars. Yeah. Entire cars. I had an argument with my sister about this recently. Well, like, within the last two years. Uh, I was like, yeah, in the South, there's so many more cars on the side of the road because they don't have regular inspections like we do in New York. And, and then she's like, no, they're just waiting for the airport. <laughs> What? You can't stop in the airport. She had a point because actually uh, it, around her in Fort Lauderdale and the Miami airport, there there were uh, a lot of a lot of cars just that had pulled over that were just waiting. But I said, no, no, a lot of those are actually broken down. And it's because there's no regular inspection. Yeah, I, I can tell you, having driven highways in South Carolina for 14 years, like you see broken down cars on the side of an interstate all the time. Well, you've been going to South Carolina for more than 14 years. And I remember when we were no, kids, North Carolina. North Carolina. But, uh, but I remember when we were younger uh, seeing so many broken down cars. I was like, what is going Why are there so, so like many 95 cars? and 40? And I will say that I was never one of those broken down cars. Very <laughs> so. much should have been. <laughs> All right, can I can I share, should I tell that quick story before we before we just finish? Uh, the, or should the I save it for trip next that time? you made down to should I share Wilmington the story? Yeah, the that's Jeep the one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. With the broken radiator. Should I share that now? Go right ahead. All right. So, I had a Jeep Wrangler. You remember this car? And I still uh, need that car. And your family was going down for a two week vacation to North Carolina. So my goal was as the blue collar working man that I am, uh, I wasn't going to take two weeks off. I was going to take one week off and meet. And I was going to go that second half of your trip. So we'd come back together, but I go down alone. Now the week leading up to it, I had had some issues with my car and my, uh, water pump, uh, blew out. So I replaced the water pump the day I was going down to South Carolina. And I left at like nine o'clock at night thinking what I would do, uh, North Carolina, what I would do is I would drive the 10, 11 hours down in the nighttime. And then I take a nap in the morning when I got there and then go hang out with you guys on the beach. Now it was sundown by the time I got on the road and I had the top off the car. I had the doors in the trunk, I think. And I had a nice, uh, nice trip plan planned down. And uh, I got to uh, about 5 a.m. in the morning, and uh, I made a couple of stops. I wasn't rushed for time. Probably and somewhere I, in Virginia. Maybe, maybe. And then as the sun started to come out, I noticed the temperature was rising on the car. Now, I hadn't had a lot of time to test drive and run the car after... I had changed the water pump, but I let it run and there was no temperature fluctuations. And then, of course, I drove six hours at nighttime and there was no temperature fluctuations. However, after being in the car for six, seven hours, as it started to warm up, the temperature gauge started to go up. Now, I realized that to counteract the temperature gauge, what I could do was slow down. Now, at this point, I'd been up the entire day before and it's now... 5.30 a.m. the following day, and I've got a few hours left in my journey. Yet, ra- one other thing you can do to cool the engine off. Yeah, rather <laughs> rather than, rather than um, fuck, you, you threw me off my train of thought here. Um, but ra- Oh, rather than finish those three hours at 65, 70 miles an hour, I'm now doing 50 miles an hour. 
but then it gets a little warmer and now I'm doing 40 miles an hour and the car is continuing. It's now it's keeping a pretty steady temperature. However, it is, it is overheating and, uh, it just keeps slowing down. So now I'm a little delusional cause I've had a ton of caffeine about four red packs. Lines. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe red li- Yeah. Probably some red lines at the time, probably some no dose pills a decent amount of coffee because I love just drinking black coffee and chewing pretzel rides when I pretzel ride rods, black coffee and pretzel rods are like my, my like long road trip go to because the crunchiness, of the pretzel rod like helps keep you awake. And then the, you know, coffee is just nice, but I also had the doors off the car and I had the top off the car. Now I was falling asleep. I was delusional. I was super anxious, a little paranoia probably from all the caffeine and this is back in the day when you had the iPod that plugged into the radio transmitter. It didn't plug into your tape player or CD player. You plugged into a radio transmitter, and then the radio transmitter would transmit on some unused frequency, like 87.5 or some bullshit like that. So I was playing, uh, what song was it? Oh, 500 Miles by the Proclaimers. I was oh. 500 Miles. <laughs> Da, 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 da. So I must have played that song for the last three hours of the trip. And I had a, uh, what would you call it, horn on the front of the car, a PA on the front of the car, a little CB radio that you could talk through the PA. And I spent the last few hours of this ride driving 35 miles an hour on the side of the highway, singing into the PA. I feel like there's, I one, would walk there's one key fun. detail that you're missing here. Oh, what, am, what am I missing? Which is it's July in North Carolina during the daytime, so the temperature is probably 90 to 95 degrees, and I guarantee that you had the heat on the car blasting. <laughs> yes, that's 100 percent correct. Yeah, <laughs> because you want to take the because you want the fans pulling the heat away from the engine. So I am just delusional, baking in the sun. Because remember, I had the top down. Uh, I think this might have been before. I, no, it couldn't have been before I had the soft top. Um, but I had the top down of the car, no doors in the car, baking in the sun, and uh, ninety to ninety-five degrees. Yeah, and and I was fucking high as fucking cafe. And, and, and the heat blasting like you're in the middle of a blizzard. <laughs> Dude, that was a that was a that was a trip that should have taken ten hours. That probably probably took me. I don't know, 15 hours maybe. Um, And this is in the days of like flip phone. I couldn't call you guys at six, seven o'clock in the morning. You were on vacation. Um, What? And it ended up being uh, the radiator or the thermostat? Thermostat, I think. One of the other. Somebody, I think it may have been your father, that was like, oh, if you have a radiator leak, which is what I originally had, um, what you can do to seal the hole is you crack an egg and put it in your radiator. Really bad idea. Which it actually works because it, you know, the egg like boils and it creates a film and it actually works. However, it's not a long term solution at all. It might be like you're at the grocery store, you got a dozen eggs, you got to make it home, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but if you do that, you're also risking screwing the entire radiator later. Radiator and water, water pump, pump and thermostat. Yeah. So basically, that's what I had to I replace. I think I went through two water pumps, uh, a radiator and a thermostat i think ultimately we might have fixed the thermostat that might have been did we get the car fixed on the way up no no, no? we drove at night and we had the heat going <laughs> god what a fucking trip that was uh that was a rough trip yeah that was also when i had the ulcer that ended up putting me in the hospital i, I was gonna ask you did you break something on, on this trip no you had an ulcer and, and and you spent the last two days of the vacation, two or three days of the vacation, like laying in bed with a stomach ache. Yeah. And then like a month later, I'm in the hospital for five days with an ulcer. Was it a month? It was that much later? It was a month? Yeah. Because like I had all sorts of other weird symptoms too, but it was probably three three weeks, maybe a month. And like I remember the morning that I ended up in the the morning of the day that I eventually ended up in the hospital, I woke up at like five in the morning, threw up black. Mm. And then I was supposed to run a fitness test for refereeing that <laughs> I morning. Remember this. Yeah. Like it was at, let's say nine o'clock in the morning. So I need to leave the house at eight. So I'm up at five thirty, throwing up 
and I'm just like laying on the couch in the fetal position, watching Sports Center. My mom comes down at about 7:30 in the morning. She says, "What in the world are you doing up?" So I tell her what happened. She says, "I don't think you're going to be going to that fitness test today. Um, like this has gone on far enough. We're going to the doctor's." And we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, um, "You're in the wrong place. The hospital's on the other side of the street." Yep. Yeah. Now I remember I had an ulcer. I think like before then, maybe, but you, but not not the amount of pain that you were in in bad, 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 bad shape. Almost like you could have died, dude. Um, if I hadn't gotten treated, this is a possibility. I lost twenty pounds in like three weeks. Oh fuck. And that was when, so right now I weigh about 170 to 175. At that time, I weighed somewhere between 145 and 150. When they weighed me at the hospital, I was like 127. Dude, scary shit. Scary shit. Like, um, I don't know. But... I'm trying to look at, I look at myself right now. I was like, I don't know where I could get rid of 50 pounds. I know where <laughs> I could get rid of 15. I don't know uh, where the other 35 are coming from. I think now is a good point to uh, to wrap our episode about flying cars. But uh, crazy, the ulcer was insane. the The trip was uh, was quite the trip. The only thing that I, the only thing I'm happy about with the ulcer is that it justified the way I was acting in Wilmington. Because I'm like, see, I ended up in the hospital for five days. I wasn't making it up. <laughs> no, yeah, I I will agree with you. I will agree with you that. It was nice to be like, see, guys, I wasn't just being a pussy. This is some real pain. And I didn't just hold out that long. I held out, like, way longer uh, until I almost died. Yeah. <laughs> so, Which, if you think about masculinity and the things that we're incentivized <laughs> to do. <laughs> Not anymore, my friend. <laughs> the pussies are winning. The, you know, the, uh, or, you know, I don't know. I saw a guy. Ah, dude, I saw a guy this weekend. I, think I was, like, I don't know, 45 years old. And he had a he had a glittery ponytail. He was a straight guy. He was, he was with his, his wife. He had a glittery uh, like bun on the top of. I don't I don't know. What I bet he has a daughter and let her do that. I was th- you know that was what I had deduced, but I did, I couldn't tell. But he was still walking around. I don't know. A lot of guys wearing bracelets and jewelry these days. So necklaces, earrings. You know, back in the day, you had an earring on there. There was I guess if one ear we, you were gay, the other ear you were. Not gay, you're just in sync or something. Oh, one dude. one placement you were by, I don't know. It was like that thing where you left your pants hanging down, and you had drugs. I don't know. I don't know all those signs. I, I I'm completely on different world. On that note, uh, too much scotch, and uh, we'll end the episode. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Adios, everyone. Later. See ya. All right. This is the other end of sip talk. This is the ass end of sip talk. Uh, if you thought this episode was ass, let me know. Uh, otherwise, let me know in the comments what you thought, what you think about flying cars, and uh, you know maybe on the the gun laws uh, because we did touch on that this episode, uh, and that is a super controversial topic. So uh, curious your thoughts. See you guys next time. I like PBR. I just got priced out of it.